The Story of Shang To Gong. In the days of King Xiong Yong, there lived a beggar in Seoul whose face was extremely ugly and always dirty. He was forty years of age or so, but still wore his hair down his back like an unmarried boy. He carried a bag over his shoulder and went about the streets begging. During the day he went from one part of the city to the other, visiting each section, and when night came on he would bundle up beside someone's gate and go to sleep. He was frequently seen in Sheng Lu or Bell Street, in company with the servants and underlings of the rich. They were great friends, he and they, joking and bantering as they met. He used to say that his name was Shang, and so they called him Shang To Rong. To Rong meaning an unmarried boy, a son of the gentry. At the time, the magician Chun Yu Chi was far famed for his pride and arrogance. Whenever he met Chang in passing along the street, he would dismount and prostrate himself most humbly. Not only did he bow, but he seemed to regard Chang with the greatest of fear, so that he dared not look him in the face. Chang, sometimes without even inclining his head, would say, Well, how goes it with you, eh? Sean, with his hands in his sleeves, most respectfully would reply, Very well, sir. Thank you. Very well. He had fear written on all his features whenever he faced Shang. Sometimes, too, when Chan would bow, Shang would refuse to notice him at all, and go by without a word. Those who saw it were always astonished, and asked Sean the reason. Sean would just simply say in reply, There are only three spirit men at present in Chu Xin, of whom the greatest is Shang To Rong, the second is Shang Pok Chang, and the third is Yun Se Pyong. People of the world do not know it, but I do. Such being the case, should I not bow before him and show him reverence? Those who heard this explanation, knowing that Sean himself was a strange being, paid no attention to it. And at the time in Seoul, there was a certain literary undergraduate in office, whose house joined hard on the street. This man used to see Shang frequently going about begging, and one day he called him and asked who he was and why he begged. Shang made answer, Oh, I was originally of a cultured family of Chula province, but my parents died of typhus fever, and I had no brothers or relations left to share my lot. I alone remained of all my clan, and having no home of my own, I have gone about begging, and have at last reached Seoul. As I am not skilled in any handicraft, and do not know the Chinese letters, what else can I do? The undergraduate, hearing that he was a scholar, felt very solid for him, and gave him some food and drink, and refreshed him. From this time on, whenever there was any special celebration at his home, he used to tell Shang in, and have him share upon it. On a certain day, when the master was on his way to office, he saw a dead body being carried on a stretcher, off toward the water gate. Looking at it closely from the horse on which he rode, he recognized it as the corpse of Shang Tu Rong, and he felt so sad that he turned back to his house and wept, saying there are lots of miserable people on earth, but whoever saw one as miserable as poor Shang. As I reckon the time over my own fingers, he has been begging in Bell Street for fifteen years, and now he passes out of the city a dead body. Twenty years and more afterwards, the master had to make a journey through South Chulu province. As he was passing Chihi Mountain, he lost his way and got to a maze among the hills. The day began to wane, and he could neither return nor go forward. He saw a narrow footpath, which, as woodmen take, and turned into it to see if it led to any habitation. As he went along, there was rocks and deep ravines, and little by little, as he advanced further, the scene changed and seemed to become strangely transfigured. The farther he went, the more wonderful it became, and after he had gone some miles, he discovered himself to be in another world entirely, no longer a world of earth and dust. He saw someone coming toward him, dressed in ethereal green, mounted and carrying a shade with servants accompanying. He seemed to sweep toward him with swiftness, 
and without any effort, and he thought to himself, here is some high lord or other coming to meet me, but then added, how among these deeps and solitudes could a gentleman come riding so? And he led his horse aside and tried to withdraw into one of the groves by the side of the way, but before he could think to turn, the man had reached him, and the mysterious stranger lifted his two hands in solution and inquired respectively as to how he had been all this time. The master was quite speechless, and so astonished that he could make no reply. But the stranger, smiling, said, My house is quite near here. Come with me, and rest. He turned, and leading the way, seemed to glide, and not to walk, while the master followed. At last they reached the place indicated, and he suddenly saw before him a great palace, halls filling whole squares of space. Beautiful buildings they were, richly ornamented, and before the door attendants in official robes awaited them. They bowed to the master and led him into the hall, and after passing a number of gregarious palace-like rooms, he arrived at a special one, and ascended to the upper story, where he met a very wonderful person. He was dressed in shining garments, and the servants that waited on him were exceedingly fair. They were, too, children about, so exquisitely beautiful that it seemed none other than a celestial palace. The master, alarmed at finding himself in such a place, hurried forward and made low obstinance, not daring to lift his eyes. But the host smiled down upon him, and raised his hands, and asked, "'Do you not know me? Look now!' And lifting his eyes, he then saw it was the same person who had come riding out to meet him. But he could not tell who he was. "'I see you,' said he. "'But as to who you are, I cannot tell.' The kingly host laughed, saying, I am Shang Turong. Do you not know me? Then as the master looked more closely, at him he could see the same features. The outline of the face was there, but all the imperfections had left, and only beauty remained. So wondrous was it that he was quite overcome. A great feast was prepared, and the honored guest was entertained. Such food, too, was placed before him, as was ever seen on earth. Angelic beings played on beautiful instruments, and danced as no mortal eye ever looked upon. Their faces, too, were like pearls and precious stones. Shang Torong said to his guest, There are four famous mountains in Korea, in which the Geni reside. This hill is one. In days gone by, for a fault of mine, I was exiled to earth. And in the time of my exile, you treated me with such marked kindness, a favor that I have never forgotten. When you saw my dead body, your pity went out to me. This, too, I remember. I was not dead then. It was merely that my days of exile were ended, and I was returning home. I knew that you were passing this hill, and I desired to meet you, and to thank you for all of your kindness that you had given me. Your treatment of me in another world is sufficient to bring about our meeting in this one. And so they met, and feasted in joy, and in great delight. When night came, he was escorted to a specific pavilion, where he was to sleep. The windows were made of jade and precious stones, and soft lights came streaming through them, so that there was no night. My body was so rested and my soul so refreshed, said he, that I felt no need of any sleep. When the day dawned, a new feast was spread, and then farewells were spoken. Shang said, This is not a place for you to stay long in, and you must go. The ways differ of we Genai, and you men of the world. It will be very difficult for us ever to meet again, and take good care of yourself, and go in peace. He then called a servant to accompany him and show him the way. The master made a low bow and withdrew. When he had gone but a short distance, he found himself in the old world with its dusty accomplishments. The path by which he came out was not the way by which he had entered. In order to mark the entrance, he planted a stake, and then the servant withdrew and disappeared. The year following, the master went again and tried to find the citadel of the Geni, but there was only mountain peaks and impassable ravines, and what it was he he never could discover. As the years went by, the master seemed to grow younger in spirit, and at last, at the age of ninety, he passed away without suffering. When Shang was here on earth, and I saw him for fifteen years, said the master, 
I remember but one single peculiarity about him. Namely, his face never grew old, nor did his dirty clothing ever wear. He never changed, and yet it never varied in appearance in all his fifteen years. This alone would have marked him as strange, but our fleshy eyes could not recognize it.